zombie stars. What, you might say? But obviously I'm not talking about undead celebrities. Some may think that we're just gonna talk about regular white dwarfs or neutron stars, remnants of dead main sequence stars. But actually it's more complicated than just that. Well, we will talk about white dwarfs, but very specific unusual cases when they basically survived supernova explosions, which they shouldn't have survived. So in a way, there are stars that somehow managed to survive something that most definitely had to kill them. Zombie stars, it's of course a nickname, but even NASA uses it. At first, to figure out what those zombie stars are, we have to briefly go through different types of supernovae. You might have seen this animation of supernova. We can see an explosion of a single star, but it's just one of possible scenarios, gravitational core collapse. When a star is in the main sequence, it remains in hydrostatic equilibrium. It's kept from collapsing under its own gravity by thermonuclear reactions that create outward gas and radiation pressure in its core. Without pressure, the star would collapse, and without gravity, it would expand, but together these two processes regulate each other. If gravity starts winning over pressure, star begins contraction, but this in turn leads to a raise in density, pressure and temperature, and core starts generating more energy and gravity is balanced out. It works both ways. If the pressure becomes higher, star expands and pressure decreases. Because of this mechanism, stars can be stable during their main sequence life cycle. When our sun starts running out of hydrogen in its core and the temperature reaches 100 million degrees necessary for helium burning, helium will start fusing into carbon. But then, our sun simply doesn't have enough mass to start next fusion cycles of heavier elements. So in the end, what is left is a white dwarf and a planetary nebula. But more massive stars, because of stronger gravity, don't just stop there and continue fusion of heavier elements such as neon, oxygen, silicon, and each phase is much shorter than the previous one. Hydrogen burning in a massive star lasts for millions of years, but for silicon it's just weeks. But a star can still support its hydrostatic equilibrium. But not until fusion reactions reach iron. Unlike previous stages, iron fusion actually consumes energy, balance breaks, gravity wins, and in a second core collapses releasing huge amounts of energy. Star explodes as a supernova. Depending on initial mass, the remnant is either a neutron star or a black hole. This is a very simplified description of only one of core collapse mechanisms. If you google supernova classification, you will see simple schemes like this one or more detailed ones with more subtypes on them. But for now, a simple one would work. Classification and names may seem counterintuitive because historical reasons. Types are differentiated based on chemical elements and properties of spectra and lines. Here we can see four types, three of which are type 2, 1b and 1c are core collapse supernovae, but type 1a happens due to a different process. They are thermonuclear supernovae. In this case, a supernova happens because of runaway thermonuclear reactions. Another difference is that it's not a main sequence star dying, but rather a white dwarf. We are closer to our zombie stars, but we are not there yet. So we have a binary which consists of a white dwarf and another star which can be different types. Components are close enough so white dwarf accretes matter of the second star. And also I have to mention a Chandrasekhar limit. We've already stated that the main sequence star remains stable due to the gas pressure balancing out gravity. But there is no nuclear fusion reactions in white dwarfs, so here another mechanism doesn't let the star collapse. And it's electron degeneracy pressure. Today we're not gonna talk about this complicated quantum process. But this mechanism also has its theoretical limit. Only below this limit a white dwarf can be stable. And this is Chandrasekhar limit, which is about 1.4 solar masses. If white dwarf's mass is below this limit and it doesn't increase in mass, then the star will slowly cool via radiation and perhaps will eventually become a black dwarf. They are only theoretical objects because it would probably take millions of billions of years to get there, so obviously we haven't observed one yet. But what we have here is a white dwarf in a binary, which can increase in mass, for instance via accretion. Then it can go several different ways. White dwarf can go nova. Accretion of material results in formation of a new layer on a white dwarf. This layer consists mostly of hydrogen. If white dwarf's mass doesn't get too close to the Chandrasekhar limit, explosion-like runaway nuclear reactions start in this layer. This generates a lot of energy and the layer is ejected into space. But the white dwarf itself doesn't explode. 
That's what NOVA is. And the name comes from the fact that for an observer, it looks as if a new star was born in the sky. A very bright star, which can be the third brightest object after the sun and the moon. And then it gradually fades away. And this can happen multiple times to a single white dwarf. But if a white dwarf accumulates enough mass to surpass Chandrasi curve limit, electron degeneracy pressure can no longer resist gravity. It collapses and becomes even denser object, a neutron star. But there is one more option, and it is type 1a supernova. Scientists still debate over details of this process, but in short, it goes like this. While accreting material, white dwarf approaches Chandrasi curve limit and the temperature inside rises so high that runaway carbon burning reactions can start and there comes supernova. Type 1a supernovae are really important and they are a subject of active research also because they can be used to measure distances in space. As standard candles, physics tells us that the object exploding should roughly be the same mass at the Chandrasi curve limit. This also means that energies of explosions are quite similar, so we can calculate the absolute magnitude of the event. And we can calculate how far the object of known brightness is, based on inverse square law and learn the distance to the host galaxy of the supernova. And we can tell type 1a supernova from other types using its spectrum. This time, a white dwarf is completely destroyed. The star dies. But it turns out, it's not always the case. Sometimes a white dwarf somehow manages to survive a supernova. This is a specific, distinct type of a supernova which we didn't see here, type 1a X supernova. Their spectra is similar to type 1a's, but these supernovae are weaker, dimmer and have lower ejecta velocities. Most likely they happen also in a binary with a white dwarf, but unlike type 1a, it doesn't destroy a white dwarf completely, but just loses some of its mass. The remnant has a different spectrum, which allows us to tell it from other white dwarfs. As a result, what remains is a small white dwarf. A dwarf white dwarf. Also, it can gain a really high velocity. A famous example is the Sand 2012Z that was seen in the galaxy NGC 1309. It was a type 1a X supernova, probably in a binary with a white dwarf. And this event could leave a zombie star. This case is special, because besides the images where supernova was first observed, luckily Hubble Space Telescope observed this same galaxy several years prior to the event. In 2005 and 2006, and scientists identified the progenitor system, which consisted of a blue star and a white dwarf. These are before and after comparison images. Follow-up Hubble Space Telescope observations in 2016 showed that there is still a source which had survived the explosion. But I must say, it can be a companion star as well, and future observations might clear things up. But the star LP40365 was observed directly. It's a white dwarf with a peculiar chemical composition that fits a zombie star model. Another feature is star's very high velocity relative to the galaxy. It is so fast probably because it was kicked out of its system in a supernova. The star is located in Ursa Major constellation. This two-frame animation shows how the star changed its position in the sky relative to the background stars after 40 years. It actually moves so fast that it's unbound to the galaxy and will eventually leave it. And very recently, in the end of June, this article came out, where scientists announced the discovery of three more very similar stars to LP40365, with similar spectra and movement. We still do not know exactly how white dwarfs managed to survive supernovae. According to one of the leading scenarios, there are white dwarf deflagrations, subsonic processes that do not lead to detonations, which are supersonic. An interesting destiny for a star. To form, die once at the end of main sequence life cycle, explode as an unusual supernova, but survive and with high velocity leave the galaxy just to continue a lonely journey through intergalactic medium for billions of years.